That was Konkomba, a language spoken by a tribal people in Ghana, Africa. And the first time that we brought the proclaimer to the Konkomba people, where over 80% of that population is illiterate, they couldn't believe that God spoke Konkomba. In fact, all the village chiefs came together. They sat up just about like this, and all the women and all the children gathered together. They said, ah, God speaks Konkomba. Ah, we don't need a translator to talk to God. Ah, he can address us directly. Gather the village, and they get a gong gong. Poo, 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 poo. Gather the people together. We have the word of God. And they gather together. And it's as if all sound is removed from the area because the people are just fixed. They've never heard Jesus speak Konkomba. And after a few minutes, they hear that same passage. And then the questions come. Why did Jesus cast the demons into the pigs? Somebody raises their hand. Well, they asked for permission. Did he know that they would kill the pigs? And they debate and they, oh, hmm, I don't know. Why would Jesus do something so evil? That's right. 2,000 pigs went off that cliff. Now, I've heard jokes as a preacher about deviled ham, but I have never really understood what that story was really all about. And after much debate among oral people like the Concombas, who are illiterate and they've never had an opportunity to hear God speak to them in their own language, after a few minutes of debate, the elders sitting on the front row, they're illiterate. They're not stupid. They're illiterate. They don't read. And as they debate, finally the village elder stands up and he says, silence the people. And he says, you know that we have a man in our village, and he's demon-possessed. Oh, that's right, he's worthless. We wish that he would die rather than even one of our pigs. And the people said, mm, that's right. And they debated, why would Jesus do such an evil thing? Now, as a Westerner, I heard that story, and I thought, now, wait a minute. How much is a pig? Think about it. How much does a pig cost? Anybody know how much a pig costs? Anybody from the farm around here? Nobody knows how much a pig costs. Probably, what, what would you say, 800 bucks? About a thousand, let's say a thousand just for round number. 2,000 pigs went off that cliff. Do you know what that's like? That's like Jesus showing up at your local church. And after the service, you go out in the parking lot, all your fancy cars are all piled up and thrown over the cliff. Because among the Concombas, 10 of those pigs were yours, five of those pigs were mine. Two or three of those pigs were yours. We heard communally. Why would Jesus do something so evil? And after much debate, the elders said, we think we know why Jesus told us this story. Because just like that man, we believe he's worthless. And we'd rather none of our pigs die than him. He said, we believe that Jesus was trying to tell us that the value of one man's soul is worth more than the whole economy of our village. Mm. This is a good saying. The entire Concomba tribe came to faith from that story. That was years ago. Today there are hundreds, even thousands of churches now. And we've distributed thousands of these devices. 
where people can gather together and hear the Word of God for the first time in their own language. I hope that I can challenge your thinking. Will you go to the next slide for me? When I look around this room, I get excited. I've never seen so much potential in one room at one time, and it just excites me. And you and the brother that had us all say, what gift have you given me? Thank you so much. Because the Bible tells us that wisdom was there at the creation in the very beginning, and that wisdom longs and cries out to be in you. He was there. She was there, the scripture says. And you guys have that kind of wisdom. And if you can connect the dots, just maybe we can do something that's never been done in the history of mankind. We do a lot of humanitarian work. And we work by providing audio Bibles alongside those who drill wells and those who feed the poor and those who uh, work in medical uh, missions, etc. And we bring the Word of God in the local languages. The digital Bible platform that we're here to challenge you to use has 830 different languages spoken by 5.7 billion people, all openly accessible, all available via API, all available for free, and we want you to do something with it. Now think about that for just a minute. That's never been done in the history of mankind. Thank you. There's one brother that gets it. 830 different languages. Did you know that 50% of the world is illiterate and lives on less than $2 a day and we will never reach them with a printed page? Never. And many of them that do learn to read, they read so poorly that they don't clearly understand the Word of God. But when you can bring it to them in an audio file, when you can bring it to them in the pocket of their phone, or on their phone in their pocket, now they have the Word of God in Mupungun, Malayalam, Ache, Cusco, Aymara, Quechua. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of languages just waiting for your talent and the gifts that God has given you to make it available to the world. Now, as we provide these audio Bibles for humanitarian groups, one of my biggest challenges is helping people understand that if you really want to bring transformational change to a group of people, yes, we feed the poor. Yes, we bring medical care. Yes, we provide water. The scripture tells us clearly that we should do these things, but not without the word of God. Why is that? Because the Word of God, the Bible tells us that in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God in John chapter 1. The Word of God itself has the ability and the power to transform someone's life, especially someone who's never heard it before. Sometimes I wish I could just take my Western English first world mentality and lay it on a shelf and say, Lord, help me understand like the Concomba villagers understood that story. There's so much truth in the word of God and yet because of our world view, we don't necessarily get it. Most of us, when we try to work among third world people, we forget and don't recognize that world views, they span across what I call a continuum now, for the sake of time, I obviously can't go into all of them today. And there's lots of other types of uh, belief systems in between these three, but there are basically three archetypes. There is animism, theism, and secularism. And believe it or not, you and I in this room, we're on that scale. Somewhere along this line, we have built a worldview, and we see the world through that point of view, and we attack problems from that particular point of view. And it affects everything that we do. An animist has, a, for the most part, a fatalistic idea about life. This is my lot. For those of you that are in here, I see people from other countries. Maybe not you, but your parents, your uncles, your aunts, your grandmother. Your, you know what it's like to live in a culture where all of your history, all of your tradition, all of your knowledge is passed on through story, through song, through dance, through proverb. Not in a book. And you know that how, how can we get the Word of God into their hearts unless it's in their own language? But what happens in the animist view, an animist feels like everything is spiritual and you have no control over the things that happen around you. And therefore you accept your lot in life 
and your whole reaction to the humanitarian work that you receive is affected by that worldview. What am I talking about? I'm talking about those that come, provide medical care, you do lots of training and teaching and you're educating them that these microbes and these germs are bad for you. But at night they go back to the village and they, they say, no, it's the demons that come and bite us on the back at night. Because that's what my grandmother told me. But when the word of God comes in Malayam, or in their own language, and they find out that there is a God who actually knows who they are and loves them, then they move to this belief system we call theism. Theism is where there is a God and he created the universe and guess what? He created the physical and the scientific and he created the spiritual. And guess what? He wants to reveal himself to you and there is hope for you. That's what happens when we bring the word of God to people who have never heard it before in their own language. They realize, you mean I have hope? God knows my name? And all of a sudden, your behaviors change. When Jesus says, love your neighbor, don't take advantage of your neighbor. Feed those, help them. One of the things that is our biggest challenge when I work with some of our human humanitarian groups is they'll go in and drill a well and the ministry's going quite well and then after a few years, they're out trying to raise money for maintenance and repairs. You say, well, how can that be? We spent all this money to drill this well. Can't those people figure out how to spend 10 bucks on a piece of uh, a, a nut or a bolt to make that thing work? Not if you have an animistic point of view. In fact, in my culture, if I see an opportunity to take advantage of my fellow brother and I don't do it, my, my, my village will shun me. Because I'm a fool. You must take advantage of somebody. This, these are worldviews that people have that we really deal with. But when the word of God comes, they realize, oh, I should, I actually am a steward of this creation that God has brought. And maybe I should be thrifty and maybe I should actually contribute back instead of the local village thug taking control of the, of the well and charging everybody exorbitant charges because that's the way that worldview and that culture works. Only the word of God changes that. Then you have secularism all the way at the other end of the scale. This is where there are no absolutes. Truth is relative. Everything is in the physical. I, I believe in science. You got to show it to me. And therefore, all morality becomes a social experiment. There are no absolutes. And the truth is, all of us are probably somewhere on that, somewhere. Even those of us that confess Christ. But there's one thing that can bring center to that. Next slide, please. The Word of God. Jesus said, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall what? Did you know that the truth in and of itself can do nothing Nothing. It's the truth you know that will set you free. You have to know it. You have to hear it. And if you cannot read, you're not going to get it in that particular technology because how does technology predominantly get into your life? It's a very literate technology. I think there's got to be a way we can fix that. There's got to be a way we can cross those bridges. UNESCO did research in some of the villages that we uh, that we work in. Sorry that that doesn't completely fit on the screen. They went into some of the villages where um, they wanted to teach literacy and they said, okay, we're going to teach you how to read. And this woman, she's got a baby on her side, a bucket of water on her head, one in her belly, and her husband's off in the city earning as much money as it, he can so they can come back and she's working this very simple plot of land and they tell her, you need to learn to read. She says, why? I need to eat. You need to learn to read because it'll improve your socioeconomic situation. <laughs> she says, did you not see? I got the bucket and the baby and the... Look, I just need to eat. But here's what UNESCO found. For spiritual reasons, people will learn to read. We have found that when we bring the Word of God in audio, book sales go up. There's this God, I want to know him. I, I, all of a sudden I have hope, I can learn, I can change my socioeconomic situation. God has a purpose for my life. That's why I want to challenge you. Bring it all together. Next slide, please. There are 7 billion people in the world, 52% of them are urbanized, 48% of them still live out in the rural areas, but as you and I both know, over the next decade, 20, 30, 40 years, sociologists are telling us 
those that study human geography, they're telling us that there's going to be this great urbanization and you'll have fewer and fewer people in the rural areas and more people in cities where they will have connectivity and they will have access. And those of us that are old like me and have lost most of their hair, we remember when there wasn't a Google. My kids? I mean, that's unfathomable. Well, did you know we actually went to the library and had library cards? We had to learn how to read those stupid things. And microfish, some of you guys are laughing. What would your children think if you said, I, you know, I need you to do this, but you can't, you can't use Google, you can't use the internet, you can't use a computer. <laughs> because it's become so pervasive, and it's happened in what, 30 years, less than 30 years? Now we see social networking in less than 10 years, almost at the same pace. Mobile penetration is now at 93%, but it's projected that this year alone, 1.2 billion, excuse me, 1.2 billion smartphones will be sold this year. 896,000 last year. Almost one eighth of the world's population already have a smartphone, and in the next 10 years, they'll all have them. I can tell you we work in villages where they don't have shoes, they got a smartphone. I was just in Guatemala, a little boy come down, in, down out of the mountains, there are, I believe there's 26 languages spoken in Guatemala, he was a little shoe shine boy, just trying to make enough money. Of course, I give him an opportunity to shine my shoes, and immediately I pull out, what language do you speak? And he says, Spanish. And I said, no, what language does your mother speak? And he says, Santa Maria de Jesus. Did you know there's actually a language called Santa Maria de Jesus? So I pull out my Bible is app, Biblia Punta Iese, push the button, push play, and the little boy shining my shoes just froze. Where did you get that? And I said, do you have a smartphone? He said, yes, Android. He pulls out his Android. <laughs> we downloaded it right then. I said, you take this back to your village and play it for your mother and play it for your family. Oh, the, the boy was so excited because God's word had come to him. He said, I had no idea. I think there's only like... 12,000 in the Santa Maria de Jesus. We have languages on here that are spoken by 300 people in the Amazon jungle. Because I believe if a translator spent 30 or 40 years of their life to get it translated, we will record it and we will make it available in a way that's going to transform those people. Next slide, please. Bible is is one of our apps, but we also distribute across smart TVs, Samsung smart TVs. We're now using the digital Bible platform uh, to beam RSS feeds up to satellite. We're now beaming, as of two days ago, we are now beaming three languages into Iran via satellite. Farsi, Dari, Aziri, and then we have Arabic as well. So we have two satellites beaming 24 hours a day, the Word of God. Anybody in Iran can get on their television in their home, and they can go to the Word of God. It says, Al-Kitab al muqaddas dot com, play, boom, Jesus speaks their language. Okay, I can't ship this in, we'll beam it from up above. And that's just the first, because there's 830 languages in that digital Bible platform that you're available to use, every single one of them needs to be on a satellite system. If we got to own the system ourselves, every single one needs to be available for free, because the gospel says every language and tribe and tongue will hear the gospel, and then the end will come. I'm just crazy enough to believe that. So we started developing um, our applications to speak to these particular parts of the world. The stats you're looking at, in Saudi Arabia, 1.6 mobile phones per person. In Qatar, 3.2. You say, well, how can that be? These are active mobile subscribers. How can that be? Well, if you know anything about missions, in Qatar, it's not appropriate to date a girl. So here's how it works. I got a couple phones. I walk by you. I throw you the phone. And now you can text me. That's why I got three phones, because I'm the man. <laughs> That's how it works. So you didn't know that, did you? That's how it works. So we said, OK, then we need to make Bible is, look Arabic, speak Arabic, act Arabic, and put it out there freely. Did you know that Bible is, Al-Kitab al muqaddas is the number one mobile app in Egypt? You probably didn't even know that because you don't ever pay attention to it. I'm going to show you in a minute. It's amazing what's happened. Next slide. Some of the reasons you are here is because of what we're seeing happening in the island. You know, the Bible says that all the islands people will hear in the last days. The scripture says that. And all of the people down here in Indonesia, one of the largest Muslim populations in the world outside of the Middle East is throughout the islands of Indonesia, and they have 1.2 mobile phones per person. This is where they don't have shoes, but they got a smartphone. 
because they're making them for you. And so what did we do? We made a Bible app in Indonesian. Alkitab.is. Just put it out there freely. Also in China, of course, these numbers are actually higher now. The penetration, we all know that China is the next boom emerging economy of the world. That's where the opportunities lie. Give me just a couple more minutes. I know I'm, I'm right on my time, but I promise I'll, I'm making sense. I'm going somewhere. Do you know what the Bible says? Well, let me back up. Have you ever had a conversation with anybody saying, man, I hate it that all my jobs are going over to China? Come on, you can admit it. We're friends here. Your parents ever said that? Somebody said that. Why are all the jobs going to China? I don't like this. This is bad in our economy. We need to bring the jobs here. Did you know that the church in China, it, the church, the Christian church in China is going at 10.2% per year? USA Today, just last month, put out an article that said, if this rate of growth continues in China, by 2020, China will be the number one largest populated Christian nation on earth. More Christians in China than anywhere else. Now, wait a minute. If I read my Bible, if I listen to my Bible, it says, if my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked ways, and then I will hear from heaven and I will heal their land. God doesn't care what your government is. He cares about who his church is. He cares about his people. So I tell people, you know what? We kick God out over there. They're letting him in. Bible is, by the way, in Chinese, is legally distributed on China Mobile. Anybody on China Mobile can just type in Bible is, and you can get it legally. We're distributing legally in China through China Mobile. Now, they don't promote it. You have to look for it, but it's there. Did you know that there are over 250 indigenous languages in China? The government only recognizes 54. But we just started working, finishing a language, northern China, where there are 30 million Muslim Chinese called the Wei people. You ever heard of them? 30 million of them. This is the first time we've even gotten scriptures in their language, but now it's being done. And we had to use a virtual recording system because it was too dangerous to go in and use this kind of equipment. So we use our digital Bible platform. We've got a system you can log on. They get a headset. They go into their dorm room, and they can record the files. It goes to our cloud-based system. We take the files in Albuquerque. We do the mastering and editing, put the sound effects on it, load it up, and within 24 hours, it's on the Bible is app. That's how we're doing it now. We're going to get them all done. In the next five years, Every single Bible that has a translation available, we can get done in the next five years with less than $30 million. The end is near. It's coming. And you guys are a part of that. Code for the kingdom is about what? I think it should be about one thing. Get God's word to every human on earth every way possible. Because that is God's heartbeat. That is his cry. It doesn't matter where you're, what country you're from. It's his word to the whole world. And I'm going to close. We're just not going to go through all that other stuff because there's no time. Maybe this one imagery will inspire you a little bit. I've always wondered about John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. Now those of you that study Greek, you know, ton theos, face to face, intimate with God. But how can the Word be God? I never have quite gotten that. And I went to Bible school. It's hard for me to wrap my Western mind around that idea. And one day I felt like the Lord really showed me. He said, Troy, all these languages, all they do is give my spirit shape. It just gives my spirit shape. And that's why when they hear it, it's me talking to them. And it's the language that's giving it shape. And so I grabbed this balloon from my grandson and I realized those of us that have a semi-secularism point of view, we all know scientifically that if I were to let the air out of this, that my DNA is actually in this balloon. This balloon is giving my breath shape. 
But more than that, my very DNA is in the balloon. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And when we find ways to provide people who think God has forgotten them because they don't have a Bible in their own language and because they cannot read, and we bring them the Word of God, whether it's on a device or on a phone or something we haven't even thought of yet, we are literally giving them the DNA of God. And that's what transforms nations. So proud of you all. Thanks for having me.